opportunities to do so. Thank you. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senator revised ministry list. In doing so, I congratulate Senator Mackenzie on her reappointment to the ministry. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and make a short statement, which I just did. Leave granted. Leave is granted. No. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on 2 July 2021. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question for Minister Colbeck. Isn't he remoting in for Mr. question Senator time? Colbeck I assume he is. Attending remotely. I'm yes, I'm here, Senator. Uh, Thank yes. you. Yes, Mr. Senator Wong. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Why did Mr. Morrison repeatedly tell Australians that getting vaccinated is, and I quote, not a race? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Colbeck, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, giving the opportunity for all Australians to access a vac vaccination is extremely important. The Prime Minister has continuously uh, reinforced that. Mr. President, Mr. President we have, uh, as we said we would, continued to accelerate the vaccine rollout. Uh, as more vaccines became available, and we've continued to open up the number of uh, uh, access points for vaccine in conjunction with the states uh, with the growth in vaccine supply, Mr. President. As of uh, the last week, Mr. President, we've vaccinated in excess of uh, one million Australians in the last week. Uh, in fact, we've vaccinated more than one million order. Australians over the last three Se weeks. Senator Mr. Colbeck, so Senator Wong, on a point of order. Senator Wong. A point of order is direct relevance. I asked a very simple question of the minister representing the Minister for Health as to why the Prime Minister repeatedly told Australians that getting vaccinated wasn't a race. Let you remind the minister of the question. It was quite specific. As long as the minister is specifically talking about the vaccine rollout, I don't believe I can instruct him how to answer the question. I'm listening carefully, um, and I've reminded the minister of that. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, as I said at the outset in my response to Senator Wong's question, the Prime Minister has repeatedly reinforced the importance of Australians getting vaccinated. That is at the heart of the four-point plan that the government has released in conjunction with the state through National Cabinet to allow Australians to have more access to freedoms as we increase the vaccination rollout. Mr. President, the Prime Minister has always, has always reinforced the importance of vaccination order. and will continue to Senator do so. Senator Colbeck, Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, I raise the direct relevance point again. Um, I anticipate what your ruling will be. I will ask you perhaps to go away and get advice on the clerk, for the clerk as to whether simply mentioning vaccinated means that your test of direct relevance being any discussion of vaccine rollout meets the relevant test. I will happily seek advice from the clerk um, on the direct relevance test. Um, I just remind senators and the minister that a narrow question requires a narrow answer, but I do not believe I can instruct him in terms on which. But I'll come back to the chamber. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, the Prime Minister has at all times, has at all times stressed the importance of vaccination. He continues to do so. It is extremely important that as many Australians get vaccinated as possible. The government has worked to continue to increase supply and the number of access points to allow Australians to get vaccinated, and we will continue to do that. We have released the data to advise Australians on the availability of vaccine over the course of this year and, of course, the four-point plan that was, re that was uh, worked through through National Cabinet is all about getting Australians vaccinated as soon as possible so we can allow more freedoms to Australian people. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. Supplementary question. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said that the vaccine rollout is not a race, and his own backbench has admitted that, and I quote, he shouldn't have said that. With millions of people in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland as we speak, and tragically 15 deaths from COVID-19 this year in Sydney, does the government regret Mr Morrison's repeated statements that the vaccine rollout is not a race. Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister can and has spoken for himself with respect to this matter. But as I have said to the Chamber in relation to uh, this question, the Prime Minister has always reinforced the importance of vaccination. The government has continued to reinforce the importance of vaccination, and we will continue to do so. We know that getting a high proportion of Australians vaccinated uh, is one of the paths out of this pandemic. If you look at the circumstances in international uh, uh, jurisdictions, we see that the pandemic is becoming one of those who are not vaccinated. The, the importance of vaccination is clearly is clearly extremely important. The Prime Minister continues to reinforce the importance of vaccination and getting Australians vaccinated as soon as possible, and the government will continue to work uh, to ensure that that's possible. Order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. With around 10 million people in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland, can this minister explain why it has taken so long for Mr Morrison to go from it's not a race to we're making a gold medal run? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I think Senator Wong misrepresents the words of the Prime Minister that uh, he put in his opinion piece earlier in the week. He was talking about the spirit of the Australian people working to getting vaccinated and, and understanding what the targets were uh, for Australians to be va vaccinated so that they could enjoy more freedoms. Uh, we make no apology for that. It, it only reinforces the point that Australians need to get vaccinated. Uh, we continue to increase the capacity of the vaccine rollout, and as I said earlier, uh, over, over a million people vaccinated in the last two weeks. The vaccination process is doing what we said it would do. It's continuing to roll to, to increase pace as we increase supply and capacity. Uh, we continue to increase the number of outlets that are available for Australians to access the vaccine. Uh, we pay t particular attention to those areas of the country that are under stress, like New South Wales, uh, and we'll continue order, to Senator do that. Colbeck, time for the answer Australia has expired. Back, Senator, order, Senator, Col Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please advise the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is implementing its plan to transition Australia from the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger and more secure nation? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Brockman for his question, and I know his enduring uh, work and interest in relation to uh, Australia, seeing through the short-term challenges and immediate challenges our nation faces, uh, but also the importance of continuing to build a stronger and more secure Australia in the long term. Uh, our immediate focus as a government continues to be dealing with the immediate health and economic crises, but also setting out a pathway through that uh, to the return of more normal life. It's built on the clear premise that by getting people vaccinated, we can make current approaches to lockdowns or border closures and restrictions ultimately a thing of the past, not necessarily eliminating safeguards and precautions that have to be taken in relation to infectious diseases, but being able to move forward. Just last week, the National Cabinet agreed in principle to our updated four-step plan to chart our path out of the pandemic and the targets we need to reach to get there. It is a uniquely Australian plan based on clear medical scientific and economic evidence. Today we've shared that expert advice from the Doherty Institute and the Commonwealth Treasury with Australians. It's a plan that gives every Australian a goal to work towards as a way out of this pandemic. It ensures that as we get through each phase that we need to reach the vaccination target on average as a country and for each state and territory, we also know the different steps that can be taken in changed management approaches to COVID-19 while still keeping Australians safe. For example, once we get 70 per cent of eligible Australians vaccinated, we move to the next phase where lockdowns will be less likely, restrictions can be eased and many freedoms returned. Those steps enhance even further at the 80 per cent stage, as the Doherty Institute evidence outlines. Australia is in a unique position amongst many nations of the world, having had the ability to work through such an expert scientific approach that can enable us uh, to work through our vaccine rollout continue to manage the pandemic 
in ways that can best position our country Order. for the future. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister out, please outline the supports the government has put in place, including with the states and territories, to support Australians and businesses affected by lockdowns? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the immediate challenges remain real for many Australians, particularly those facing lockdowns in Greater Sydney, in South East Queensland and others uh, along the way. Uh, we're directly delivering financial support to impacted individuals and to businesses. Be people who have lost more than 20 hours of work in the previous week during a lockdown can claim $750. People who have lost between eight hours or a full day of work to 20 hours can claim $450. These are equivalent levels of support that we provided with JobKeeper last year, but in a more targeted, tailored program uh, that can effectively reach those who need it most. Uh, in fact, it's a program that Premier Dan Andrews has likened uh, to being uh, an updated version of JobKeeper. Individuals who currently receive an income support payment through our social security safety net will also receive an additional weekly payment of $200 if they have lost more than eight hours of work, whilst we have plans operations in place with states and territories in relation to cost-sharing support for small and medium-sized businesses, all of it designed to help ensure we get people through these Order. difficult times Senator and they come back strongly Senator afterwards. Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please update the Senate on the progress of the vaccination rollout and the steps the government is taking in cooperation with the states and territories as part of the national roadmap? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, I want to thank uh, the millions of Australians who are turning out to get vaccinated. And with numbers growing each and every day, we now know that around 12.6 million doses have been administered across Australia, and more than a million doses a week are being administered. And we've acknowledged there were early challenges to the program in terms of uh, expected deliveries that didn't arrive, uh, in terms of changes in advice from medical experts, uh, but nonetheless we're now seeing a total of 4.5 million vaccinations administered last month, which is more than double what was achieved in May, when 2.1 million doses were administered. This steady increase in supply, coupled with a steady increase in distribution outlets, is ensuring that we have the strongest possible position uh, for Australians to be able to get vaccinated, uh, to know that the supply will be there for them, the outlets for them, and that we can reach the 70 and 80 per cent targets outlined by the Doherty Institute uh, to safely Order. proceed to Senator the next stages Birmingham. of pandemic management. Senator Keneally, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In late June, the Prime Minister said in response to the Delta COVID-19 outbreak in Sydney, and I quote, I commend Premier Berejiklian for resisting going into a full lockdown. Does the Morrison government stand by this commendation? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and can I say I do commend New South Wales for the work that they've done in managing COVID-19. Clearly, throughout the pandemic, they've done an exceptional job. The Delta variant, however, has presented a, a range of new parameters for us to deal with. It moves much more quickly. Uh, and as we've learned more, more about it, it's been clear using the health advice and the scientific evidence that we've had to change our approach. The New South Wales government and the Prime Minister have both acknowledged that, uh, and the government will continue to adapt its approach to COVID-19 uh, as we meet all of the challenges that come towards us through the pandemic, as we have done through the pandemic so far. The, as has been said on a number of occasions, there is no rule book to this pandemic. Uh, we know that new variants will come, uh, and they will change the way that we have to approach the pandemic. Uh, and we will continue to meet those challenges, Mr. President. Australians can be confident of that. But the thing that we need to concentrate on right now is to continue to increase the pace of the vaccine rollout. That's where the government's focus is. That's why we've released the plan that we have to allow the economy to reopen. That's why we're increasing the number of uh, points where Australians can access uh, vaccine. And that's why we're working with the New South Wales government to increase the capacity in those areas of concern in New South Wales, Mr. President. Uh, we will continue to do that. We will continue to meet the challenges that this pandemic throws up 
to us all. Uh, we'll continue to support Australians uh, as they need to be supported, Mr President, uh, and we'll continue to increase the capacity of Australians to get um, access to a vaccine because we know that is one of the uh, most important pathways towards a more normal life for all Australians. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As a result of Mr. Morrison's bungled vaccine rollout, the Business Council of Australia has estimated that the Sydney lockdown is costing the economy $257 million a day. Does the Morrison government regret supporting a delayed lockdown in Sydney? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Morrison government will continue to act on the health advice in support of the management of this pandemic. We will continue to work with the states and territories to support them with their management of the state of the pandemic, as we have done all the way through through the formation of national cabinet and the decisions that have been made there, Mr. President. Uh, the advice that we've received uh, in respect of both the management of the current outbreak in Sydney with the Delta variant is that uh, the lockdown is appropriate. Uh, it needs to be uh, appropriately managed because of the speed at which the Delta variant works. Uh, and of course, having an appropriate management of the uh, local community and the lockdown also brings with it uh, or removes the possibility of longer lockdowns, uh, and which will have a, an even worse economic outcome. So, Mr. President, order. Uh, we Senator will continue Colbert, to work. Time in for the answer Australia has expired. Se order on my left, Senator O'Neill. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Mr Morrison's mismanaged vaccine rollout has tragically led to the deaths of 15 people from COVID-19 in Sydney. Will the Morrison government apologise for Mr Morrison's wrong advice to the New South Wales Premier and for failing to protect the people of Sydney from this devastating COVID-19 outbreak? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I simply do not accept the allegation that's been put forward by Senator Keneally in her question. The decisions with respect to lockdown in New South Wales are decisions of the New South Wales government. They have responsibility for those matters uh, under their public health responsibilities. It is absolutely tragic that we've lost a further 15 lives to this current outbreak, uh, to this new variant. Uh, and I extend my condolences to every one of those families uh, that, uh, that are involved in that loss of life. But, Mr President, the suggestion that uh, the vaccine rollout is responsible for this current outbreak is simply not true. Uh, Mr President, I reject completely the premise of the question that's been put Order, Parliament Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order. We are going to another question. Senator Seawitt, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister's press conference on the modelling by the Doherty Institute leaves a lot of unanswered questions, showing only a set of slides. Will the government release the modelling for, by the Doherty Institute in its entirety, including any technical papers and reports? And Min if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. My understanding is, uh, and I don't, I don't have a, a brief on this with me, unfortunately, um, Mr President, but my understanding is that we, it is our intention to release the modelling from the Doherty Institute. Uh, so um, I, I can't give any further advice uh, with respect to the technical papers, but my understanding is that it is the government's intention to increase, uh, to release the modelling from the Doherty Institute so that Australians can understand the rationale behind the decisions that are being made as a part of the uh, plan to reopen the economy. 
Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister take that on notice, please, and confirm if the technical reports will also be uh, released? Can I, uh, can I ask also? The government is aiming for 70 per cent of the adult population to be vaccinated for, stage B, for phase B, which actually equates to 56 per cent of the entire population. If we start leaving, leaving, lifting restrictions at around that range, the Grattan Institute predicts there could be close to a million cases of COVID. Have you looked at the Grattan Institute's Order, modelling and are you concerned? Time for the question has expired. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to take on notice the part of the question that I wasn't able to answer or send to see what previously with respect to supplementary work. Mr. President, the government has made its decisions based on the modelling from the Doherty Institute. Uh, the, 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 that modelling is based on those people who are currently um, part of the recognised vaccine rollout. So, Mr. President, uh, I, I haven't seen the paper that's been done by um, the Grattan Institute, Mr. President, but the government, uh, through National Cabinet, commissioned the Doherty Institute to do the research that was required to um, provide the benchmarks for opening the economy. Uh, I've indicated that uh, it's the government's intention to release that institute, uh, that, in that information, Mr. President, and that information is based on the current parameters of the Order, vaccine Senator rollout. Colbeck, time for the answers expired. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Thank you. The TGA has approved the use of Pfizer in children aged 13, and, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 12 and over. Children are essential, an essential part of any vaccine strategy. Why didn't you include children over 12 years of age in your vaccination targets, and are you going to? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, that information, from my understanding, will be uh, included in the data from the Doherty Institute that is being released publicly so that Australians can understand uh, what's, uh, what, what, is the, what the basis is for the targets that have been set. Uh, bearing in mind, Mr. President, uh, that it's only in recent times that there has been a, an approved vaccine in Australia uh, for um, children between the age of 12 and 16. Uh, the um, Pfizer uh, vaccine is now approved for children, uh, and my understanding is that the data being submitted to the Australian government for the Moderna vaccine likewise is seeking approval for children um, uh, for those over the age of 12. So, Mr President, uh, all that information will be available once the Doherty information is released, and I understand it's being released Order, very soon. Senator Colbeck. We'll move to Senator Griff remotely. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Last week, Rosa Mayoni pleaded guilty to killing Anne-Marie Smith. Ms. Smith was an NDIS participant in Ms. Maloney's care, but suffered extreme neglect. She ultimately died in what South Australian police described as disgusting and degrading circumstances. Ms. Smith's death led to an independent review known as the Robertson Review, which reported in August last year and made 10 recommendations. Minister, how many of these recommendations does the government support and how many have been implemented to date? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator very much for his interest in this case. Uh, it is now more than a year since the absolutely tragic death of Anne-Marie Smith, and can I say no Australian, no Australian should ever have to die the way this lady did. Uh, and the death does continue to sadden and shock many people across Australia. As the Senator has said, in August 2020, the support worker alleged to have been providing support to Ms Smith was arrested by the South Australian police, charged, and has now pleaded guilty. In May 2020, the NDIS Commissioner appointed the Honourable Alan Robertson uh, SC to conduct an independent review into the NDIS Commission's uh, regulation of integrity care, the provider concerned. 
and the review was publicly made available on 4 September 2020. In August 2020, the NDIS Commission revoked the registration and issued a banning order against Integrity Care, the provider of support to Ms Smith. In addition to this, the Commission has taken a number of other regulatory actions in relation to Integrity Care and to Ms Smith's former support worker. In relation to the Robertson Review itself, uh, the government is fully supportive of the review and all its recommendations. And in fact, we have a bill in this place uh, at the moment, which the Community Affairs Committee is currently uh, taking evidence on. So we are absolutely and resolutely committed to delivering quality and safe NDIS services to all participants to meet their needs, but also to support them to live free from violence, from abuse, from neglect and also from uh, exploitation. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. One review recommendation, Minister, was for the NDIS to establish a community visitor scheme. Now, that would allow vulnerable participants to have face-to-face -face contact of an independent person who can ensure that they are being cared for and their rights respected. Now, a similar scheme already exists for older Australians receiving home care packages. When will the government implement this recommendation? And if not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you again, uh, Senator, for that uh, question. Uh, this is an issue that I'm very familiar with, and the South Australian Minister has also raised this issue directly with me uh, for obvious reasons. It is something that I'm hoping that the Community Affairs Inquiry will also uh, look into, and I understand that they did take evidence in relation to this issue, in relation to the balance between the right of privacy versus the right of entry and how to deal with that situation. So I very much look forward to the Community Affairs Report uh, on the legislation. But we clearly have to get the balance right between a, a person's right to privacy uh, in their own home and also how we ensure that they are best protected. Senator Griff, final supplementary question. Minister, the review also recommended each vulnerable participant have an individual within the NDIS who is responsible for their safety and well-being, a single point of contact, if you like, when things go wrong. Will the government implement this recommendation? And I don't think we need to, to wait for any other inquiry or community affairs review of any type. Will government implement this recommendation? And if not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, and I thank Senator Griff for that uh, question. Uh, in relation to that matter, it is something that I'm seeking further advice from the NDIA on and also the Commission. Because again, it's uh, like many things with the NDIA, you move one lever and it actually impacts other aspects uh, of the implementation of the scheme. So, Senator Griff, I'll take that aspect on notice and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The Prime Minister has announced that Australia will enter its next phase out of the pandemic when 70 per cent of the adult population is vaccinated. On what date will this target be reached? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I'm looking on the screen. Thank you, Mr President. Yep. Well, Mr President, the government deliberately has not established a date for that to occur because that particular matter is in the hands of Australians. But what we will do is continue to encourage Australians to come out and get vaccinated. And, what, and, and we will also continue to increase the number of avenues that they can access a vaccination. Uh, and we have continued to do that, Mr. President. Uh, as we've had access to more vaccine, we've increased the number of avenues for Australians to get vaccinated, whether that be through state clinics that we were operating, uh, we're supporting the states by provision of, of vaccine, whether it's through the GP respiratory clinics that are now providing uh, vaccination Order. services, whether, whether it's through the GPs who are doing a magnificent job, Mr. President, of uh, providing vaccines for Australians, or by growing the number of access points across the country through pharmacy, Mr. President. So we will continue to provide access to Australians to the vaccine, and we'll continue to increase the number of 
uh, outlets available uh, as we continue to Senator grow the supply. Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill. Mr. President, we haven't uh, deliberately uh, put a date on that. We want Australians to come out and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, and the point of setting the targets, using the advice of the Doherty Institute, is so that Australians understand the thresholds that are required for them to enjoy more freedoms and for the country to continue to work to its way through uh, this pandemic, Mr. President. Uh, it would be, it is not the right thing for us to, to, to attempt to set a date for this, Mr. President, uh, but we will continue to do everything we can to encourage Australians to access a vaccine. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Don't the 10 million people who are now in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland, who have been let down by Mr Bro Morrison's broken promises, deserve to know when this target will be reached? Isn't being up front with 10 million Australians in lockdown the Australian way? Order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. No, I don't accept the characterisation that's been placed on this matter by Senator Watt at all. Australians all understand the importance of beating this pandemic, of beating this virus, but they also understand that they have a choice to come out and get vaccinated. What we will continue to do is to encourage them to do so, by providing them with good advice with respect to the vaccines. And what we'll also continue to do is to increase the number of points that are available to them to access the vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. The important thing is to uh, ensure that Australians understand, understand the targets that are there to allow us more freedoms under the transition plan that's been announced uh, and worked on through National Cabinet very cooperatively and to provide opportunity for Australians to both Access Order, Senator and receive... Colbeck. Senator, what a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government's own COVID response plan includes measures, and I quote, encouraging uptake through incentives. Why is the Morrison government prepared to publicly consider discounts and frequent flyer points, but ruled out any other direct financial incentives? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, uh, we've ruled out the plan that's been put in, that's been announced by the leader of Order. the opposition, uh, because it's a bad plan, Mr. President. Uh, as it was described to me this morning, Mr. President, all thought and no, uh, all bubble and no thought, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, we will do what we need to do uh, Order. to Sorry, encourage Senator Colbert, Australians. Please um, pause for a moment. Pause the clock. I appreciate the chamber is robust. I'm just actually struggling to hear Senator Colbeck. We do need to change our regular behaviour and be a touch more compliant with standing orders about interjections during a remote session. I appreciate the chamber is more quiet than normal, but the chamber needs to be especially quiet because I need to be able to hear the answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, so, Mr. President, we will continue to encourage Australians to come forward and take a vaccine. Uh, part of the reason that we set the four-point plan out was so that Australians understood what the thresholds were to enjoy more freedoms. So we will continue to support them by providing greater access to vaccines through both supply and access points, Mr President, because we know that all Australians understand the importance of uh, getting a vaccine so that we can all enjoy more, more freedoms uh, and, and get on top of this pandemic. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. As we continue to battle the COVID-19 pandemic, many people are becoming increasingly affected by their inability to work because of lockdown and movement restrictions. Can the minister please outline what financial support the Liberal and Nationals government is providing to people who've lost hours of work in areas who are currently locked down, including Commonwealth hotspots in and around Sydney? 
The Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the Senator for her question and her uh, advocacy and passion for her home state of New South Wales. And I think everyone in this chamber uh, stands with those that are experiencing a lockdown in New South Wales right now. Well, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented impact, not just in Australia, but around the world. More than four million lives have been lost, and we're facing the largest global imp economic impact since the Great Depression. Order. In the face of a once-in-a-century pandemic, the Australian spirit has shone through. Early and decisive actions in 2020 saved lives and livelihoods. We closed our borders. We established the National Cabinet. We invested, as, as a federal government, $291 billion in direct assistance to individuals and businesses to cushion the impact. And we know that these measures have had a significant impact on all Australians and have ensured that we've been able to weather this storm together. And when we look globally, uh, not all countries can say that. The Liberal and Nationals government has stood side by side with all members of the Australian community throughout the pandemic and will continue to do so as the Delta variant wreaks havoc in so many of our states and communities. As the virus evolves, so does our government's response, because there is no guidebook for COVID. And that's why I'm proud to be part of a government that's delivering targeted, localised, individual uh, support payments to those who live or work in a Commonwealth declared hotspot. There are two tiers of payments. If you have lost more than 20 hours of work as a result of the lockdown, you are eligible for a $750 payment. If you've lost between eight and 20 hours uh, as a result of that declaration, you're eligible for $450. And if you're on income support payments and have been working, you are also eligible for a $200 payment if you've lost more than eight hours. I would recommend that those who are in those uh, areas apply online to keep services as Australia's phone Senator lines McKenzie. open for those. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On the 28th of July, Prime Minister Morrison announced an expansion to the COVID disaster payment. Can the minister provide details on the increased financial assistance being provided through the scheme and how this will affect communities in lockdown? Senator McKenzie. Thank you. If people have lost hours due to the impact of lockdown, I do encourage them to apply, log on to Services Australia or MyGov uh, and actually apply for these income support payments. We've rolled them out in Victoria, we're rolling them out in South Australia. They're helping and assisting uh, people in New South Wales right now and will continue to do so as that lockdown uh, is extended. And they will be available to those Australians in those Commonwealth uh, declared hotspots in South East Queensland. Because we know that this is tough. Being locked down is tough. You have to shut your business. You can't go to work. You have to homeschool your kids. Uh, we actually, and it doesn't just impact your financial situation, it also impacts your mental health situation. So we have a raft of payments in addition to this. The pandemic leave payment assists you so that if you are caring for someone with COVID, or indeed you uh, catch COVID, that we will be standing with you to ensure that you have financial Order, support. Senator McKenzie. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the standard process for the COVID-19 disaster payment that will be undertaken for future lockdowns should these occur? Senator McKenzie. Well, as this pandemic has rolled through the world and indeed our own nation over the last 18 months, state and federal governments have had to adjust their responses accordingly. We've used science, we've used data, we've used evidence. We've used the advice of our medical officials, which is exactly what we should be doing. We should be taking the politics out of our COVID response. And that's why I look forward to those opposite. Uh, supporting Australians to get vaccinated as fast as possible, because that's how we can actually get out of being locked down, actually stopping those lockdowns by ensuring that Australians aren't just getting Pfizer, aren't Order. just getting Moderna, but are actually Order. lining up to get AstraZeneca. Senator and I Wong. look forward to Labor Party senators tweeting, putting in their newsletters, making sure at their local branch meeting they're encouraging Australians of all ages to adopt the medical advice, get vaccinated and access Order. AstraZeneca. Order. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, Order. Senator Wong. Senator Lambie is on her feet. Senator Lambie. 
Senator Wong, Senator Lambie is on her feet. Order. Order. <laughs> Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Attorney General, Minister Cash. Minister, the Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide is underway. People are ready to make a submission. We are waiting further instructions. They want to be called to give evidence at a hearing, but before they can do that, a lot of them need funding for legal advice. It's been three months since the Prime Minister announced the Royal Commission. When will people know what the plan of attack is here? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her question. And I also thank Thanks, Senator Lambie, for working constructively with me uh, in the lead up to the announcement of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. Uh, and Senator Lambie, you are correct. On the 8th of July 2021, uh, the Royal Commission, as you know, uh, into Defence and Veteran Suicide was established by letters patent following agreement from the Governor General and a period of consultation which you and I consulted on in relation to the terms of reference. What we've done as a government is we've provided $145.3 million over two years from 2021-22 for the Royal Commission, including to support families and advocacy organisations to participate in the inquiry. We are committed also, as you know, to establishing an independent national commissioner, and you and I have discussed this, for defence and veteran suicide prevention. In terms of the Royal Commission itself, uh, it will be required to deliver its interim report by the 11th of August 2022 and a final report by the 15th of June 2023. In terms of engagement with the Royal Commission, which is what you have referred to, it will be up to the Royal Commission itself to determine the most appropriate ways to engage with people about their experiences, whilst balancing that with the need to complete the inquiry in a timely manner. I think you and I actually discussed uh, that the letters patent recognised the need to establish accessible and appropriate trauma-informed arrangements for people engaging with the inquiry. The Royal Commission itself is now accepting submissions from all interested people and for organisations. Uh, it is, though, as you know, independent from government, and it itself will actually determine how all hearings uh, should be run. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. So, uh, the tender for the government's legal advice helpline only opened two weeks ago. The Royal Commission was called before Anzac Day. Uh, you know, why didn't, why can't, can't the department or the government walk and chew gum at the same time. Now, you already decided you were having a Royal Commission back in April. Why couldn't you have asked for tenders back then, even before you got anything signed off? Why are we so far behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Lambie. And you and I will have to disagree in relation to why we are so far behind. Um, and again, I thank you for working constructively with me uh, in relation to the terms of reference of the Royal Commission, uh, just in terms of what support will be available uh, for people who want to engage with the Royal Commission. And as I said, it is for the Royal Commission itself to determine uh, how those people will be engaged. Uh, but certainly the government recognised the importance for those engaging with the Royal Commission and the fact that these people do need to be, as you and I have discussed, professionally supported. Counselling and support services will be available to assist people calling or engaging with the Royal Commission, including counselling support available before, during and after a person participates in a hearing or a private session. A legal financial assistance scheme, and again you and I have discussed this, will also be available to people called as witnesses Order, to the Cash. Royal Commission. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, can you guarantee that the thousands of us who have taken years to fight the department have thousands of pages of documentation will have funding to use our own lawyers if we get called up to by the Royal Commissioner? Can you guarantee me that there will be no more psychological harm done to any of us or our children? Senator Cash. And again, thank you, Senator Lambie. And you raise a very good point in terms of. Uh, as I referred to in my previous question, uh, the fact that support does need to be made available uh, to people who are engaging with the Royal Commission, uh, in particular recognising the types of experiences that these people have had. 
And that's why, when we set up the Royal Commission, one thing we were very, very clear about is recognising the importance for those engaging with the Royal Commission and to ensure that there are the mechanisms in place uh, so that they are professionally supported. And again, I've, as I've said to you, if there are any ways that you feel um, order, that these can Senator Cash, Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator yeah, thank Lambie. you, Mr. President. Um, I think, you know, to save everybody some hurt here, we just want to know if we get called up in front of the Royal Commissioner. Senator Lambie, what's your, your point my of order? My point of Sorry? order is I asked the question, will we have funding to use our own lawyers? That is what I would like answered, please. You, we need to know this now. Senator Lambie, you, I'm Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm, President. There is a lot of people hurting out there Senator, because of this. Senator I'm going to put it. I'm going to stop it now. Senator Lambie. One question. Senator Can Lambie, we use our own lawyers? Senator Lambie, please resume your seat. I allowed you to restate part of the question. I wasn't sure what you were doing. I allowed you to restate part of your question. Um, you reminded the minister of the question. She has 16 seconds remaining to answer. Uh, as I said, Senator Lambie, legal, uh, a legal financial assistance scheme will be available to people who are called as witnesses. An independent legal advisory service, counselling and support services will also be made available to people engaging with the Royal Commission, and private sessions will also Order. be available Senator for Cash, individuals time for the answer has who wish to share. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister, can the minister confirm the Morrison government's 70 per cent Phase B target only includes Australians aged over 16, and as a proportion of the population is only 56 per cent? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I indicated to the, to the Chamber earlier, the advice on the targets is based on the modelling of the Doherty Institute. It's not, some, it, it's not a number that's been chosen by the Prime Minister or, for that matter, by any of the state premiers and national cabinet. It's based on research by the Doherty Institute on the thresholds required to start reopening the Australian economy and community during the pandemic, Mr. President. So it's, the, the thresholds that are being put forward are based on the research, Mr. President. As I've indicated to Senator Seward earlier, that research is going to be released publicly. Senator so Wong, all Australians have point access of order. Senator Colbeck, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Point of order, direct relevance, a very simple question. Uh, which is clear from the Doherty research released, and I assume this minister is aware of it, that the 70 per cent relates to the population over 16, and if they are included, in fact, the threshold is 56 per cent. We're asking the minister to confirm it. Um, Senator Colbeck, on, on this occasion, the question was specific and factual in nature. Um, to be directly relevant, you must direct, address the facts in question. Um, so I'm going to remind you of the question. It was a specific question seeing, seeking a fact. You've had 50 seconds, uh, and I'll remind you of the question that was asked. Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, the thresholds uh, are based on the Doherty Institute research that has been publicly released. Uh, and, and, and the research is based on the vaccination profile of the population uh, that was assessed by the Doherty Institute, Mr. President. So I am happy to confirm the numbers that are in the Doherty Institute data. Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator, Senator Wong. I repeat my previous point of order. Um, and I would have supported that point. The minister, at the last sentence, he said he was confirming numbers contained in the modelling. Uh, that was referred to in the question. So I'm going to ask the minister to restrain his comments to the facts sort. Um, but at that point, in my view, he was being directly relevant with that phrase being used. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, the reason we're releasing the Doherty Institute data is so that all Australians understand completely the parameters for the opening of the community. That's why I'm very comfortable in confirming that information and that data as presented by the Doherty Institute. It's important that everybody understands, that all Australians understand, that the decisions that we're being made, 
that, that the government is making in conjunction with the states to open the economy and to open the community is based on research uh, as has been um, accessed by the government. And so I'm very comfortable in confirming Order, the figures Colbeck, in the Senator Gaudi Chisholm, a supplementary uh, question. Thanks, Mr President. Ten of yesterday's 13 new COVID-19 cases in South East Queensland were children under the age of nine. Children under the age of 16 are still not eligible, able to access vaccinations. When will parents be informed about their children's eligibility for the vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, in fact, uh, the Minister for Health in the last day or so has actually confirmed access to vaccine for children between the age of 12 and 16 uh, based on certain health conditions. So that process is being commenced uh, and is being supported by the advice of a target, Mr President. Uh, we have one vaccine that currently uh, has approval for use for children between 12 and 16, and that is the Pfizer vaccine, Mr President. And the Minister for Health yesterday announced a number of parameters where children with certain uh, health indicators can, in fact, start to access uh, a vaccine, Mr President. There are no vaccines at this point in time in Australia that have been for, approved for use for children under the age of 12, Mr President. So we will continue to follow the health advice in the Order, support of Australians. Senator Colbeck, vaccines. time for the answer has expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Can the minister confirm the Morrison government is confident vaccinating just 56 per cent of the population will protect Australians and allow for reduced restrictions? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, that is the advice from the Doherty Institute. That's why we're following the advice from the Doherty Institute. Uh, and that's, that's why we commissioned the work in the first place, so that we would, could understand and make the appropriate decisions on the thresholds that were required for governments through National Cabinet uh, and at a state level to make their decisions in relation to reopening the economy uh, and the community. We all want to see the back of this pandemic as soon as possible, Mr President. That's why we continue to work every day to ensure uh, availability and access to vaccines and to grow that availability and access, Mr President. So the work that's being the decisions that are being taken are based on the research that's been commissioned by the government at the request of National Cabinet uh, to support the reopening of the Australian economy. Uh, and we will continue to follow that advice. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small Business and Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. In light of the unprecedented economic situation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and these ensuing waves, can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are securing Australia's recovery by continuing to support small and family businesses right across Australia to get through the current COVID-19 lockdowns? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Uh, Mr President, as you know, small and family businesses, there is no doubt, they are the backbone of the Australian economy. And since the outset of COVID-19, the Morrison government has backed small and family business with unprecedented levels of support. And of course, we will continue to do so. We also know, and you just look at the numbers in the Senate here today, that there is still a lot more work to do. We've now seen recent COVID outbreaks in Victoria, in New South Wales and in Queensland. And what that says to us is we're not out of the woods yet. In terms of New South Wales, the business support package in New South Wales, which we partnered with the New South Wales government to deliver, provides a template now for further support measures that will help small and family businesses get through the pandemic. In New South Wales, again in partnership with the New South Wales government, we are delivering between $1,500 and $100,000 per week 
for qualifying businesses that have seen a significant downturn in their revenues. For smaller businesses, and in particular small and micro businesses, those ones that only have a small number of employees, they'll receive a minimum payment of $1,500 per week. And Mr President, as you know, in your home state of Victoria, we also partnered with the Victorian government in business support during their recent lockdown. And we, of course, stand ready now to work with the Queensland government, as we did with the Victorian and the New South Wales governments, to provide the economic support for small businesses to get them through the lockdowns. We've done this before, and we know that businesses will come through this and will get back to doing what they do best, which is, of course, employ Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline to the Senate how the government is supporting our sole traders across Australia throughout these lockdowns? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, what we saw last year with the onset of COVID-19 was the Morrison government providing crucial economic support to sole traders to keep their businesses going. We utilised measures like JobKeeper and, of course, when I was the employment minister, allowing owners to meet their mutual obligations by working in their business. That was so important, so they didn't need to close their business down. This helped around 690,000 sole traders around Australia, and it meant that they were able to continue in their business. They could hibernate their business if necessary, and then as restrictions eased, they could get back into business. And of course, this time round, it is no different. For sole traders who are currently affected in Queensland, from Saturday, you now have the ability to apply for the COVID disaster payment. Services Australia will open applications on Saturday the 7th of August and claims will start being processed from Sunday the 8th of August. You just need to go through MyGov. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister also advise what individual Australians can do to support our small and family businesses and sole traders and contribute to our economic recovery. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, across Australia, it doesn't matter where we are, supporting our small and family businesses, and in particular those who are affected by the lockdowns, is just so important. So many businesses are still able to keep their presence going via the internet. And so I'd say to anybody across Australia, if you do know a small business uh, that is affected by the lockdown, but they are still able to keep going, uh, it is just so important that we are out there and we're supporting them. Uh, Australians are obviously doing everything they can to help get through this difficult pandemic. However, what we want in particular for our small and family businesses is for them to be operate freely under circumstances as close as normal to possible. And of course, the best way individual Australians can support our small and family businesses and of course thereby contribute to our economic recovery is to get vaccinated as soon as they are eligible. Getting vaccinated is our path back to normality and the key to our recovery. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the new Minister for uh, Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. How many discretionary grant programs is the minister responsible for in her new role as the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education? The Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I do thank the senator uh, for his interest in how our government is supporting those communities right throughout rural and regional Australia recover from natural disasters, respond to um, what is Senator, often— Senator Farrell, on a point of order. Uh, point of order, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, it was a very simple, straightforward question. How many discretionary grant programs is the minister responsible for? Um, you reminded the minister of the question. I will take the opportunity that, while I won't judge direct relevance in 15 seconds when the minister is introducing her answer, um, I will remind the minister it was a very factual question uh, and doesn't provide much room for commentary in order to be directly relevant. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, Senator Farrell. I was through you, Mr. President. Was absolutely going to. Uh, outline all the grant programs that our government 
is very proud to be able to deliver to the communities who have been affected by flood, by bushfire and Senator indeed— Farrell on a, Senator McKenzie, I have Senator Farrell on a point of order. Look, I appreciate— I appreciate, I appreciate that this is the first time the minister has had to answer questions since her uh, coming yes, back to Farrell, the position, but uh, I don't want to know all of the programs that the government has got in the grant uh, area. I want to know how many okay, so this minister Farrell, is responsible I, I, for. I do allow flexibility in making a point when direct relevance, but I do ask that senators draw it to that. Senator McKenzie, this was a factual question asking about programs. Um, not rationale or commentary around the programs. Um, the minister is entitled to list programs and be directly relevant or provide the uh, or answer in a form that Senator Farrell would seek, but it's not a place for commentary around programs. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And so I will go through the disaster recovery funding arrangements, the Disaster Resilience Australia package, where the min minister is responsible uh, for the measure, but the um, decisions are delegated to the NRRA. That's $2.1 million uh, for this fin financial year. The Disaster Risk Reduction Package, which is a package to reduce the risk and impact of disasters on Australians in line with our Disaster ri Risk Reduction Framework, its co-funding obviously with the Australian and state and territory governments. Approval for these reports by the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience Agency will trigger in 2021-22 payments to the states and territories in June 2022. Then we've got the Emergency Response Fund. This funding is actually to fund emergency response, natural disaster recovery and preparedness initiatives. Uh, that is also uh, the purvey of the NRRA. Then we have the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program, a $280 million grant program over the next three years, uh, which is actually to assist those communities who have been impacted by bushfires. Uh, the Minister for Emergency Management and Recovery, that would be me, uh, is the decision maker. The local economic uh, Order, recovery Senator program. Order, Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has um, expired. Oh. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, I have a further supplementary uh, question. <laughs> Uh, is the minister responsible for any other grant programs in her new roles as Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communication and uh, Regional Education? Bearing in mind my first question related to discre discretionary grant programs. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The Local Economic Recovery Program. Uh, where the Coordinator General, uh, whilst it is in my purvey, he and state governments are the final decision makers on that one. The restocking, replanting and on-farm infrastructure grants. Uh, the minister only involved in funding decision if there's a change in the National Partnership Agreement. The Resilient Kids, what a great program. Senator Macdonald and I were able to announce $2 million to school children who've been in flood-affected uh, communities for mental health support. Um, those decisions are part of a national party, uh, the par national partnership agreement, economic diversification over the next three years. Uh, that's nine million dollars. Uh, again, is covered by the national partnership agreement, as is the telecommunications and energy improvement schemes. Uh, management of disaster risk again is under the national uh, partnership uh, agreement um, reallocation. Issues. The recovery and resilience Order, grants, Senator which is McKenzie. $20 million. Senator over Farrell, four. a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And if there are some others that the minister didn't get to answer, then I'd be happy if she um, tabled the documents. But I have a further question. How much funding uh, or budget allocation has been provided to the minister, discretionary or otherwise, in her new roles as Minister for Emergency Management, uh, National Recovery and Resilience, and Minister for Regionalisation? Regional communications and reg regional education. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Uh, I will have to get back to you with the totality of the budget allocations. Obviously, my last 
uh, three weeks, as you can see, from the brief time we've had to spend together outlying the programs that I'm responsible for and who makes decisions. I've got a lot more to go through, which I'm happy to uh, give you a private briefing if, if that would assist you. But I think the heart of your question, Senator, might actually be going to the role of ministerial discretion in a Westminster democracy. Now, I'm actually, as I've said on the public record, Ministerial discretion is absolutely key to how our government functions. Ministers should take the advice uh, and recommendations of departments and agencies and then exercise ministerial discretion appropriately. Um, and my ministerial discretion in other programs I've administered resulted in a fairer Order. outcome Senator for McKenzie. Australian taxpayers. Time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice.